I'm, I'm not Rahu, but I'm Raju Venugopalan from Bukhava yeah. National Lab. And um, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, is um, somewhat um, a, a different field, <laughs> but I was uh, dearly hoping to uh, be there so I could learn from uh, the many experts in non-equilibrium dynamics at this workshop. Uh, but unfortunately, because I'm at a national lab, I'm not uh, still allowed to travel. Uh, so anyway, my topic is thermalization, but in uh, quantum chromodynamics. Um, and um, a lot of the motivation for thinking about this problem uh, came from a question posed by T. D. Lee um, in the early 70s uh, as to uh, what happened if you could boil the QCD vacuum, uh, so to speak, uh, to high temperatures and uh, the mechanism it envisaged was um, colliding two nuclei at ultra relativistic energies. Um, and, and at that time, he, what he thought about as ultra-relativistic was a few times the, the nuclear mass um, in energy. Uh, but now uh, we've been having um, collisions of heavy ions, so gold ions um, at Brookhaven, um, at our relativistic heavy ion collider with energies of up to 200 GeV per nucleon, so very ultra-relativistic. Uh, and CERN's taken it. Uh, to the next level where you have collisions of these ions at 5.5 TeV per nucleon. Uh, and, and what a, a, a consequence is that um, we achieved uh, TV Lee's dream uh, of really boiling the vacuum to very high temperatures, uh, specifically um, by creating a deconfined non-abelian fluid called quark gluon plasma. Uh, which is the hottest temperature on Earth. It's about um, uh, 10 to the 12 Kelvin or so, a few times 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is the, the process of, of thermalization and such violent collisions. Um, I, I unfortunately will not have time to talk about um, an equally interesting set of phenomena where you uh, have collisions at lower energies, where you also explore the QCD phase diagram uh, in temperature and chemical potential, baryon chemical potential, uh, where you're, uh, you have interesting phenomena related to uh, phase transitions, uh, quenches, so you can study things like kibble zurich type uh, non-equilibrium phenomena. Um, and there's a beam energy scan at RIC, which is exploring these sorts of questions, but unfortunately that I won't have time to discuss that. Um, so this is a very complicated problem um, where you're really looking at um, the non-equilibrium dynamics of a non-abelian gauge theory uh, in three plus one dimensions. Uh, and, and as many of you know, and I don't need to tell you, is that thermalization is a very difficult problem, even for very simple systems. And therefore, it, in understanding this phenomena, you need both ad initial theory, phenomenology, and insights from other subfields. Uh, but Despite all of these, this complexity, we've been able to construct the elements of what one might call a standard model of a heavy ion collision, which is depicted here in this striking plot of a heavy ion event in the Atlas detector at CERN, where you produce uh, on the order of 10,000 particles, uh, which stream to the detector. So these are subatomic pions, scaons, mostly pions, uh, and other such hadrons. Um, and so the, the, the questions, of course, are a real-time problem in quantum field theory. Uh, and one can first start by asking, what are the relevant degrees of freedom in these colliding wave functions? So clearly it's not nucleons. You have, you have, you have uh, densities and, and, and um, energies, uh, but you know, a few hundred times that of nucleons. So it's obviously the quarks and gluons that are the fundamental constituents of these wave functions that are the relevant degrees of freedom. And you can ask, how is entropy generated? What are the universal features of this non-equilibrium dynamics relevant for this workshop? Uh, and, and then this uh, picture of a formation of a quark gluon plasma, a thermalized fluid, uh, which has, uh, as some of you may have heard, a very low uh, viscosity to entropy ratio. It's a nearly perfect fluid, which then uh, hadronizes at late times. And you see these particles that uh, that you see, you measure in a detector, and the question is to reconstruct uh, this timeline. Um, and so here's a kind of space-time diagram of such a collision. Um, and um, uh, the, the interesting questions relevant for this workshop are uh, the existence of universal phenomena, which are at early times, like non-thermal attractors that I'll talk about, uh, 
and, and at somewhat later times of hydrodynamic attractors, um, which precedes the formation of the quark gluon plasma and its subsequent hydrodynamic, uh, viscous hydrodynamic uh, expansion. Um, so, uh, so of course, it's very hard to cover all of this in this short period of time, uh, but uh, we have a review published this year with Jürgen Berges, Miao Heller, Alexis Mazlowskis, uh on, on all of these different aspects. So if you're interested, uh, please take a look. So you can post this problem some level as the unreasonable effectiveness of hydrodynamics. And what I mean is that uh, you have, you see that if you produce some kind of uh, an isotropic spatial lump uh, in, in such a collision of quarks and gluons uh, with very high occupancies or densities. Uh, and the question is, you know, how does this spatial lump translate over time into momentum space and isotropies of the particles that you measure? So you get some distribution of momentum space, and you can look at moments of those anisotropies, and that's what's shown here uh, in, in measurements of these flow harmonics, so to speak, of these momentum anisotropies. Uh, as a function of the momentum of these particles. And you find that hydrodynamic calculations, relativistic hydrodynamic calculations, which put in these kinds of uh, anisotropic initial conditions, do a fantastic job of describing the data quantitatively. Uh, and extracting from these experiments a very low value of this uh, entropy, uh, sorry, viscosity to entropy uh, density ratio uh, very close to a conjectured lower bound of one over four pi. So this is kind of a very interesting um, result, which which suggested that what we may be forming in these uh, in these collisions at some point in time is is a nearly perfect fluid, uh, which which is sort of expanding um, close to speed of light. Uh, so the question is, you know, why why does this occur in such in such a short lived system with uh, with with um, um, very short lifetime, yeah, so at very short lifetimes. Uh, and so to understand this, you can think about the problem in two ways, the two clean, so to speak, ab initio approaches. Uh, one is holographic thermalization, a la ADS-CFT, uh, that you may have heard of, uh, where you have a uh, duality between strongly coupled supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory to classical gravities, to weakly coupled classical gravity. Uh, and so you could ask questions about the strongly coupled theory and employing this duality. Now, it's it's not the right theory. It's not QCD. Uh, it has significant differences, but valuable insight can be gained into its universal features. Um, for example, about questions about transport coefficients and hydrodynamics far from equilibrium. Uh, the other possible uh, ab initio approach is that of looking at very high occupancies. Uh, so you look at a regime of theory where the occupancy is extremely large, F is much greater than one, but the coupling is very weak. Uh, so such that G squared times F is, is of order one. So this is also a very strongly correlated regime of theory. And much of my talk is going to be devoted to the second of these two approaches. But regardless, to apply these considerations to actual experiments, uh, you have to make extrapolations to realistic values of these couplings, which are not realized in these experiments. So that's so that that's where we need the guidance from experiment, of which there's a tremendous amount of data for us to to constrain our our theoretical um, playground, um, and and also universal features of dynamics through interdisciplinary connections can also provide powerful guidance to these studies. So. Um, because I, I, uh, I don't have time to go into this, uh, let me just say that the, the initial dynamics, uh, our, our understanding of the degrees of freedom in the wave functions can be understood in, in, in QCD's high energy limit, which is often called the Regi limit. Uh, and in this framework, nuclei can be described as very highly occupied, order one over alpha s, uh, where alpha is the QCD coupling. Uh, very highly occupied gluon shock waves um, characterized by an emergent hard scale. Okay, so that's a that's a hard scale, so this is sometimes called the saturation scale, and that controls the the entire dynamics of of, of these collisions. 
And there's an effective field theory description called the color glass condensate. I'll just refer you to uh, this review here if you're interested. And so there's an enormous simplification of the problem uh, because of this high occupancy, because to the leading order, you can understand these, uh, these extremely complex collisions as a collisions of lumpy gluon shock waves. Okay, they're lumpy on some scale, which is much smaller than the size of the proton, um, um, uh, but they can be treated as classical fields that are colliding. And so we know then in QCD how to treat this problem. It's the, it's the solution of the Yang-Mills equations with, uh, with, with sources, which are uh, the other degrees of freedom in the problem, uh, corresponding to so-called valence, uh, gluons and quarks. And so you can solve the Yang Mills equations. These sources live on the light cone. They move at the speed of light. And so you can solve the Yang Mills equations. And there's a characteristic scale, as I mentioned, of these sources, which is this saturation scale. So you can actually solve these, these uh, classical equations of motion numerically, of course. Now there's a there's a uh, there's a uh, genuine correspondence between uh, this physics that I'm talking about, the so-called little bang, heavy ion collisions, um, uh, with that of the big bang, uh, where again, you have some highly occupied field, uh, which then sort of interacts with fluctuations and thermalizes into the hot era, about 300,000 years after the big bang. Uh, and likewise, there's an analogous thing going on here, where you can you measure an isotropies in the distributions of particles to learn about the, the very early time physics, of what happened. Um, specifically, uh, the, in the in the in the Big Bang case, the physics of decaying inflaton with high occupancy is that of this decaying non-equilibrium gluon fields called the plasma with the same one over Q, uh, alpha s occupation number. There's an explosive amplification of small momentum fluctuations, low momentum fluctuations, uh, which are the analog of Weibel instabilities in plasma physics. Uh, which which plays a similar role to that uh, in 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 of uh, uh, the parametric uh, amplification, the amplification of small fluctuations in the early universe due to parametric resonance, and it's the interaction with between these fluctuations and the classical field which are conjectured to lead to thermalization, uh, and a similar phenomenon might also be occurring in, in these heavy ion collisions. And there are other common features, which I will briefly allude to. Uh, so in the, in the, in the um, in, in inflationary context, there's a nice review by Michan Katcha, which I would also refer you to. So when you solve these classical Yang-Mills equations, uh, because the sources for these equations live on the light cone, uh, they are, the physics is essentially boost invariant, which is, by which I mean, the dynamics is essentially two-dimensional transverse dynamics as a function of the proper time. And, and what you find then when you solve these classical equations is that, that the, the pressure is, is essentially transverse. The launch pressure goes very quickly to zero. And so it's a very, very anisotropic system. And, and so the question is, okay, you know, how can this system thermalize? Um, and, and so to, um, to understand that, uh, we can um, think in terms of the role of, of uh, quantum fluctuations in this problem. So you can consider as a toy example, a scalar phi four theory, where you have a background classical field, which is only a function of the proper time and this transverse degrees of freedom. It's this boost and variant scenario I mentioned. So there's also uh, the, in principle, the dependence on the space-time rapidity, which you can think as the analog of the longitudinal size of the system. And so what you can do as in this toy example is you can compute quantum fluctuations, which you can represent in terms of uh, this integral here, where you have some amplitude governed by some Gaussian random variable, uh, time to solutions of the small fluctuation equations and these, uh, Hankel type functions, which is formed the basis of this. Uh, and, and you see that if you just solve the classical equations, then you have the energy density and pressure, which you can compute in quantum field theory. Uh, and I'm considering here the homogeneous case where the spatial distribution is not important for simplicity. And you see that they have no single value relation with each other. However, when you include these Gaussian random fluctuations, 
uh, over some time, you see that the energy density and pressure, uh, they after averaging these fluctuations, fluctuations uh, in this in this zero plus one D conformal theory, they 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 achieve some single value distribution. And this can be understood in term by looking at the phase space density in this simplified uh, example, the zero plus one D theory, uh, of as a function of the field and its time derivative. So in the Poincare plane, where you start with some this initial Gaussian weight packet, and you see very quickly that it sort of fills this uh, this Poincare plane here, just as you would expect for you know an ergodic system. So uh, one sees there that this, these quantum modes seem to satisfy a kind of eigenstate thermalization, which was uh, conjectured by Barry and significantly developed by Shrednicki and others as being essential for the thermalization of a quantum fluid. And this seems to explain this, this kind of pre-thermalization phenomenon that one sees uh, entirely arising from quantum fluctuations. So in the, in the, in the QCD case, uh, similarly, the classical equations are this purely two-dimensional. So these are the gluon distributions plotted uh, as a function of transverse momentum on this axis here and longitudinal momentum on, on the other axis. And you see initially that there's no distributions, boost invariant, there's no distribution in longitudinal momentum. Uh, but then you have these vacuum fluctuations which interact with these strong fields and there's an instability that develops. Uh, and the instability is, grows exponentially. Okay? It grows as the, so it's a kind of butterfly effect which just enhances these instabilities. So on a very short time scales, which are just logarithmic, you, you get an over-occupied system. Okay? Uh, also in the longitudinal direction. And this is actually an actual result of classical statistical lattice simulations of a three plus one D uh, gluon fields which are exploding into the vacuum. Um, now, okay, so you get this over-occupied system. Now what then? So there's then, if you look in the momentum space. Of Sorry, we have three, four more minutes. Sorry? Three, four more minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm kind of going slow. Okay, so, so um, you find that there's two phenomena. One is there's a dilution occurring due to the expansion of the system, which tends to squeeze the PZ modes. And then the scattering, which tends to fight against that. Okay. And, and what you find is that the system as a function of time does not flow to equilibrium, but it flows to a non-thermal fixed point uh, where the single particle distributions are not characterized by PT and PZ, but by some self-similar quasi-stationary function, which is then characterized by these, these coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay. Uh, and you see this also in the numerical simulations where you can actually do this and extract these values where you start from this highly occupied system with very different isotropies, and the system picks a particular attractor to lie on corresponding to specific values of these alpha, beta, and gamma. So in some sense, this theory, this theory this, these simulations help identify the right kinetic theory that describes this physics of what's going on. And what we find remarkably is that these, these uh, coefficients are identical uh, as well as the, sca the scaling function, the self-similar scaling function uh, is, is, is identical to that of self-interacting scalar fields with identical initial conditions. Okay? So there's a remarkable universality that one observes between the longitudinal expanding uh, hottest fluid on Earth and the coldest fluid, which, which are these ultra-cold uh, atomic gases represented by self-interacting scalar fields. Uh, and and you, you can extract, you find that they have exactly the same values uh, for alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, and, and of course, people have been doing um, uh, cold atom experiments. Um, so these are some results from, from the Oberthal labs at, at, uh, at, at Heidelberg, where they considered, you know, uh, uh, rubidium atoms and some uh, hyperfine manifold and looked at the spin correlation functions as a function of time, uh, and, and they were able to observe such self-similar scale, scaling behavior with alphas and betas extracted as shown here. Of course, this is not, this is a static geometry, and to the best of my knowledge, the expanding geometry has not been looked at so far. 
So the picture that emerges of thermalization in, in heavy ion collisions is you start from some very far from equilibrium, highly occupied system of gluons, and the system flows to a non-thermal fixed point, uh, and uh, and which is characterized by these unifer universal scaling exponents, which are identical, as I mentioned, to that of these uh, cold atomic gases. But the system is still far from equilibrium. Now, it's the classical methods that I mentioned break down beyond this point because the occupancies become order one. But then you can use kinetic theory to further follow the system. And, and these simulations that I mentioned help pick out the right kinetic theory. Uh, and, and that allows you to then follow the system all the way to equilibrium. Uh, this is, by itself is a very a fascinating process of how that actually occurs. Uh, but again, I don't have time to go into that, but there's a beautiful paper by, by our Mueller, Schiff and Son, which I would refer you to, to, to fully follow this through. So, so the remarkable thing is that in this highly complicated quantum field theory, non-abelian quantum field theory, one can, in a particular framework uh, at very high energies, follow the system all the way through to thermalization, where you can extract the thermalization times and the thermalization temperatures in terms of the, the coupling constants, powers of the coupling constant, and this emergent close packing saturation scale, which characterizes high occupancies. Um, so you can also um, in, in understand perhaps the precocious applicability of hydrodynamics by, by, um, by considering whether hydrodynamics may be applicable if the system is still far from equilibrium. Uh, and what I plotted here is the anisotropy between the longitudinal and Francis pressures of this expanding system um, as a function of a parameter, which is now here characterized in terms of the time times the temperature. Um, and so what is shown is, is our results, uh, which are based on uh, Yang-Mills, N equal to four Yang-Mills simulation, now strongly coupled, um, again, using uh, holographic duality. And you see that as a function of W, these very different initial conditions, which are shown here in gray, they all very quickly settle to a universal curve, uh, which corresponds to a kind of Knudsen expansion of the constitutive relations. So the first order, second order, third order constitutive relations, which can be computed analytically, can be compared to numerical simulations, which go up to 240 turns in the inverse Knudsen number. And you see that this all kind of converges very nicely to, to some universal curve. Uh, so you can plot, for example, uh, the, the energy density of such a system as opposed to what you would expect from hydrodynamics as a function of the, of the inverse Knudsen number, a dimensionless quantity. So for very large values of this, of this quantity, you expect it to be hydrodynamic. It's a good, it's a good expansion parameter. Uh, but then you find that it's actually more precocious than what you, that you, what you assume. And you see, see that in, in a large variety of different kinds of uh, models that one applies to such a system from kinetic theory to a CFD, you see some kind of precocious um, behavior indicating that hydrodynamics are maybe applicable far from equilibrium. Now there's a very interesting interplay between this phenomenon of hydrodynamization and how a system of highly overoccupied gluons becomes an equilibrium uh, system of both quarks and gluons. So quarks are produced at a later time than, than, than gluons. And so, so there's a chemical equilibration process that sets in, uh, which actually occurs well before the system reaches a kinetic equilibration. Uh, and this is also something that one can follow uh, and, and try to quantify uh, and compare to results from experiments at, at Rick and the LFC. Uh, so, so to summarize this particular line of thought, uh, you can follow the system all the way to thermalization, uh, where you have a thermalized path of soft blue ones uh, on time scales, which are given by honor QS times the coupling uh, with the te thermalization temperature proportional to the saturation scale. Uh, 
Now, what this tells you is that if you go to the strict Rayleigh limit where QS goes to infinity, the, the powers of alpha will never beat since they, alpha goes as one where log over such a scale. So this tells you very interestingly that as you go to the limit of asymptotic energies in QCD, the thermalization time goes to zero okay, as one over QS. So these logs in the, in the, so even though you have very, very weak couplings, uh, the very, very high occupancies overwhelm them and the, and, the, and the thermalization time goes to zero as QS goes to infinity. Now there's a lot of interesting phenomenological things one can do with the experiments. You can do a kind of event engineering, which is very clever, where you can study, uh, uh, you can try and extract A or S as a function of the particle multiplicity that you can trigger on in these in these uh, heavy ion experiments. And you can study for a variety of systems, so from heavy ions to proton-proton collisions. And it turns out that if the the this ratio of A to RS is close to the conjecture bound, even small systems like proton-proton collisions, which have very small radii, very small sizes, that they can also thermalize if the, if the multiplicities of the systems are sufficiently large. So there's some very inter interesting interplay between the system size and the multiplicities of particles and so on, which you can use as a kind of event engineering and try to understand thermalization and such the systems. Uh, and you can use this insight that we discussed in terms of bottom-up thermalization to actually make, look at very differential observables. So you can look at fluctuations in the transverse momenta of different particles as a function of these multiplicity in different systems and compare this to data as is shown here in some model calculation. Um, so yeah. if you want at least one question, you should jump to Okay, okay. so I, okay, I think I'll just end here. I just wanna say that there's some very interesting phenomenon called the Carl Magnetic Effect and uh, this interesting role of topology. And let me just end here. Uh, I'm sorry to have gone over my time, but I just will put out a list of questions that I'm interested in and, and take questions from people. Okay, I will pick up only Nicole and Taun. So all the others, unfortunately, we'll have to try to resume privately. Yeah. So please, yeah, I'd be happy to continue offline with people. <laughs> so please, Nicole, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thanks very much for the talk. Would you mind clarifying I might have missed this. Would, would you mind clarifying how ADS-CFD is the wrong theory, but you still use that? Uh, okay, so, so uh, I mean, what, so, yeah, so it, you use it in the sense that you can compute uh, certain quantities in ADS-CFD, for example, the viscosity uh, or the viscosity to entropy density ratio, for example, using ADS-CFD because you compute uh, the, the autocorrelation function of the stress energy tensor uh, in a strongly coupled uh, n equal to four Yang Mills theory by its holographic duality to weakly coupled gravity. Now, then there's a conjecture that this physics is universal. So this bound of one over four pi, uh, which is for eight over s, uh, which was conjectured to be universal, was obtained from such an ADS CFT kind of calculation. So the idea is that by by because ADS CFT is a way to compute uh, observables in truly strongly coupled quantum field theories, uh, specifically in Yang Mills like quantum field theories in three plus one dimensions, uh, you may learn some something about the properties, real time properties of of uh, uh, such strongly coupled quantum fields. Uh, uh, which may be universal. So it's really sort of invoking universality. But for specific properties of the theory, uh, it's not very useful. In fact, you can rule it out very quickly. <laughs> uh, but the question is, you learn something about phenomena and the theory which are hard to understand uh, otherwise. Okay, thank you. Oh, please, you conclude the session with one last question. Sure, uh, thank you. So. Um... So the uh, one question I had was, okay, is the entropy, suppose I want to calculate eta over S along this whole, the function of maybe time. So if you're in the in the uh, pre thermal I mean, before thermalization in the hydro hydrodynamic regime, do you have to 
kind of think of how to define an entropy actually in that region because the, you may not have access, access to all the states which are accessible in the thermal in the thermal equilibrium so you have to change the definition of entropy that's one question and maybe let me ask the quickly the second question because I will probably get cut out if I <laughs> keep it for later. So the, there's also this developments about um, that the um, things which have holographic viewer are, are maximally chaotic and maybe QCD is a bit like that given eight hour S's some are also magic, almost close to one or four pi. So did you also look at things like uh, uh, this out of time order correlation functions or TOCs and check that they also come to the bound uh, saturated by holographic theories. Have that been also been looked look within your kinetic approach or, or any of these approaches you are discussing? Yeah, these are the cool questions. Okay, so, so let me let me address the the, the the first the first question. So, uh, and, and in fact, <laughs> this is one of the outstanding open questions, the middle point that, that I mentioned here. Um, where so so the way to think about it is that okay so you have this very complex system and then you have in there a separation of time scales between modes and and here one is really focusing on the the entropy of a of a lump of very highly occupied gluons okay so these are highly occupied gluons of really maximal and uh, uh, so so in principle you can ask you know what's the in entanglement in entropy of this of the system. Now it turns out that, uh, and this is a paper by Gia Dwali and myself that I would refer you to, that it turns out that there's a there's a there's a striking uh, correspondence between the creation of such highly occupied lumps and the entropy of black holes in, in kind of a quantum portrait of black holes, where you can actually count the number of microstates of these black holes, and there's an area law that actually characterizes. Uh, this this entropy uh, in this case here, which scales in terms of the saturation. It's a closed packing scale that I, I mentioned earlier, which controls the dynamics. Uh, and so you, you get an area law which can be characterized in terms of this very strongly screening closed packing scale in the theory. Uh, and and uh, but but in general, computing the entanglement entropy in such a system is is impossibly difficult uh, in, you know, in this quantum field theory. But in this very specific limit on these very spe special conditions, we argue that it's it's exactly the Bekenstein entropy that one, one gets uh, in, in the two cases. Now, to come to your second question, um, I, I'm not an expert, but I believe people have looked at um, OTOCs in, in, in this context. I mean, I, I see no reason why one shouldn't is really a formal uh, correspondence, right? An ADS CFT, um, which you can you can make you can do these kinds of computations as well. Uh, but but I'm not an expert on that that aspect of those computations. So. Thank you. All right. So it's time to thank Arju, Sebastian, Zala, Marzina for the very nice session. I mean, I think. There were a lot of engaging questions, which is the spirit we would like to convey in this hybrid time, which is very hard to keep since everybody now seems to have a life back. And so everybody wants to be in reality and not virtual anymore. And I think is the challenge that we are facing here at this hybrid KTV program. So for those that are still in Cornwall, I doubt there are many. Uh, enjoy your coffee break and your lunch. See you later in the afternoon for the flesh and bone session. And thanks again, everyone, for contributing. Bye. Bye-bye.